Welcome back to Musr Mondays. This is the 38th installment of our uh, of our Musr Mondays series on the book of the Ramchal, the Mesilat Yesharim, and we are currently in chapter 10 on page 164. If you remember, what we spoke about last week is that in order for a person to go on the next step of their spiritual growth, right? So we gave already two fundamental principles. Number one is zihirut. You got to be watchful. You got to be careful. Look around. Understand what you're doing. Get to know yourself. That means if a person is angry and they don't even recognize that they have anger, it's a big problem because they'll go their whole life with the same anger and they won't properly fix it or correct this trait right we don't want to end up at the end of our lives realizing you know something I should have worked on my traits a little better that's number one so the first is vigilance not only anger it's any trait a person who's jealous a person who's who is uh, who is uh, you know um, a person, a person who's kind, also by the way, positive traits as well. If a person who's kind and they don't know that they have that trait, they don't properly uh, make that trait shine the way they should. They don't make it beautiful the way it could be. So a person has to identify who they are. And the way to identify themselves is, we spoke, we spoke in, in length, great length about this, is to start examining your day every day evaluating as you know every evening right about your day think about your day what was my day today who did I interact with right what could I have improved in what way could I have been better okay the second step that we spoke about was Zrizut what is Zrizut? Zrizut is alacrity you gotta be very very careful careful about pushing things off if you push things off what ends up happening you don't get them done Particularly when you have mitzvahs. When you have a mitzvah and the mitzvah you don't do right away, you don't tend to it right away, what ends up happening is that it ends up disappearing and we lose opportunities. And our sages warn us about not letting things fall to the side. Right? You have an opportunity, do it right away. Don't say, I'll take care of it later. I'll, I'll find out about it later. Do it right away. Okay. Now, it doesn't only mean means we have to understand that this trait is not just not procrastinating, okay? It means prioritizing our life, our whole life mission, with what is most important and get that done. And then take the next. But the problem is that sometimes the things that are most important, we push all the way to the end. But the things that we're excited about, we bring forward to to the beginning. I'll tell you a quick story about this. My grandfather of blessed memory, um, see, my grandfather was a Musser master, right? I would call him a Musser master, Musser master which is he, identifying his character, knowing his character, and teaching thousands of people about the Musser movement and understanding, uh, uh, learning to understand themselves. So there are two stories that stand out. Number one is that he would send his students to go for a walk at night alone and just get to know yourself. Very interesting, very important exercise. He says one night, one of the students came to his house, white like a ghost, knocking on the door, terrified. So my grandfather asked him, what happened? He says, did you meet somebody? He says, yeah, I met somebody. He says, did did he mug you? Did 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 he hurt you? He says, no, but it was a total stranger, someone I never met before. He says, who did you meet? He says, I met myself. (laughs) <laughs> he says, my whole life I've been living with a certain understanding of who I am, not realizing that's not who I am. This is really who I am. And his whole life he's going around with a, how many of us potentially could be going around thinking that we have certain beliefs or certain ideas or certain traits that really those aren't our traits. They're traits that we may have seen by our parents or grandparents, but it's, that's not really me. But we have adopted, adopted them because it's comfortable. It's what I know. And it could be sometimes very terrifying for someone to break out of what we know to become something new, the person who we really are. That's the first story. The second story, my grandfather, when he was in yeshiva, so they have two different aspects of learning. One is learning with your mind, which is the Talmud. 
right? You sink your 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 brain into a page of Talmud, and you, you have all of the commentaries, and you have all of the different opinions, and it's like it's very deep. And then you have the character. Now, the Torah says that the Mishnah tells us that you can't learn one without the other. You can't learn and stimulate your brain. Right? with the Talmud, without developing your character as well. You have to work on your character while working with your intellect. But there are two different parts of every yeshiva study. Right? Yeshiva study, you will have you know, many hours a day of, of sinking your brain into very deep Talmud study. And then you have a period of the day where you also try to sink your mind into yourself, into who you are. So... Understanding that my grandfather was a Muslim master from birth already, he had this inclination to work on himself <clears throat> and to perfect himself. So when he had these two, you know, two uh, idea, two things that two subjects that he needed to work on, right? So which one would he gravitate to more? Of course, the Muslim study, right? Working on himself. <clears throat> and when he had notes that he needed to write. From both classes, which do you think he wanted to write more? The Musser notes, of course. So what did he do? He wrote the other notes first. He wrote the other ones first. He wrote the Talmud notes first. Why? So he'd be sharper for those. Because the things that you love to do, you're going to end up doing because you love them. The things that you don't necessarily, necessarily love to do, those are the stuff you say, you know what, I'll get to it later, and then you never get to them. He says, no, 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 I'm going to do those first, and then the things I love to do, I'll take care of. It's like you have, you have two rooms to organize. One is fun, it's all your gadgets and stuff, and one is the paperwork. You know, you, you know? It's like, yeah, I'll take care of the paperwork later, and then the paperwork never gets done, mm-hmm. right? And it just keeps on piling up. And you all, right? So that's, that's the idea. So when we talk about priorities, it's also understanding our values and so on and so forth. Now, what's the next step? The next step is cleanliness. So we think cleanliness is like, let me organize myself, okay? Let me, or, no, that's not what it's about. Cleanliness means, how do I maintain my spiritual self without getting it tainted with bad influences? That's what cleanliness means. It means keeping your soul clean, keeping your soul pure, keeping yourself holy, and not allowing yourself to get pulled down by things that are impure. I'll give you one quick example that's not going to be brought down by Ramchal. Technology. Okay, technology is very, very powerful. It's extremely powerful. In fact, I bet that everybody in this room spent at least an hour today either on a phone, technology, or on a computer, technology, or on some other device, right? Right? Why? Because that's the world we live in today. You can't do business, you can't do commerce, you can't do, you can't, you know, trade stocks, you can't do anything today. You can't even communicate with your family member on the other side of the globe, like my wife is right now, 8,000 miles away with your wife, right? Um, and it's, 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 it's a, it, how do you communicate? Well, to, that's what you have technology, it really is amazing. That's the good part of technology. The ones that help you be productive, the ones that help you produce, the ones that help you communicate. But what's about the destructive technology? That's also there. And as we know, and we've discussed many times, is that there is always an equal challenge. There always has to be 50 grams of goodness that you could do, or 50 grams of not good that you can do. A person can go to a website and, 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 and hear Divrei Torah, and hear words of Torah, and be inspired, and read beautiful articles, or God forbid, there are terrible things that one can do. A person can waste time with clean things, a person can waste time with terrible things. So the power is is almost 50-50, and I think that that's one of the reasons that we were inspired, if I remember correctly, several years ago when we started doing these live broadcasts online, is because we have to make Facebook holy. It's used for plenty unholy. But this is like putting Facebook into a ritual bath and like purifying it, right, with the words of Torah. And if Torah could be disseminated on YouTube, on, 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 on Facebook, on Twitter, wherever it goes, 
with holiness, it's a great thing. My rabbi once told us, he sent us a, a, an email to all of his students, and there are over 450 rabbis that have received rabbinic ordination from my rabbi, and he said a very important thing. He said, if any of you do not have a filter on your internet, don't call me anymore. Okay? And you wonder, okay, it's not like his students are a bunch of lowlifes, okay? They're rabbis, right? It's not, but you know what? There's no such thing as a human being who doesn't have a moment of temptation. There's no such thing as a human being who doesn't have a challenge. You have to protect, it's like saying that I, everybody knows that there's a cliff there so no one even gets close. So I don't need to put a fence there, right? No. You put a fence. Why? Because someone might not notice. Someone by mistake can fall off the cliff. You don't take chances. If you care about your spirituality, my rabbi said to us, you don't take chances. So you put a fence. So on all of my devices, I have uh, these, these apps that block anything that, that could potentially, if there's a news article that has links on the bottom, you know, sometimes they put these advertisements that are, that are inappropriate, it won't let it load it. It won't let it load. Why? Don't fall into a trap. And that's one of the things, when we talk about Nikyut, cleanliness, we're talking about how do we cleanse ourselves to be in a place, to be in an existence where we don't have these traps that are self-imposed many times. Many times those traps we put there by not putting those barriers. It's very easy to put those barriers, okay? So, so we're on the top of 164. Ramchal goes on to explain how this changes as one progresses from Zihirut and Zirizus to Nikiyut. Okay, so we said those first two stages, and now we're moving to the third stage. However, after a person habituates himself greatly in this trait of zihirut, meaning being watchful and careful, okay, and uh, not to fall into into um, a trap, to the point that he has achieved a first stage of cleansing himself, namely from the well-known sins. And he habituates himself in the divine service and the zrizut, the, the alacrity required for it. And as a result of this, the love for his creator and a craving to be close to him will intensify within him. So the minute a person eliminate some of those distractions. All right, I'll give you an example. Um, we have a special day called Shabbat. Every week, every seven days. It's an amazing thing. The greatest gift in the world. So I have a friend of mine who's not a religious Jew by any stretch of the imagination. And he decided that he's going to try to do a digital Sabbath. Okay, meaning... For 24 hours, he's going off his phone, going off his computer, no technology whatsoever. <clears throat> and he says that he felt like this sense of elevation and a self, a, a self-awareness that he didn't know existed. What did he do? He didn't. Right? You wonder, what did he do to get there? He didn't. He didn't do anything. All he did was stay away from doing things. Okay, you understand what's going on, right? That means sometimes it's not about what you do. It's sometimes don't do. Sometimes it's not what you say. It's what you don't say. It's not what you eat. It's what you don't eat. You understand? So we're always used to thinking, I'm going to go, I'm a, I'm a doer. Sometimes it's not to do. Nikiyut sometimes is just staying clear of not doing silly things. Silly spiritual things. Things that are spiritually uh, damaging. 
What happens when you stay, when you refrain from those things? You know what happens as a result? You feel closer to God because you have less things as a barrier between you and the Almighty. So what you're essentially doing is removing those barriers that are blocking between you and God by just staying away. I'll give you an example. If a person knows, and I had, I had a woman who once told me that she had a meeting every week with her friends. They'd go for coffee. And after coming to classes, she realized that there was a problem because in her classes, in her, in her meetings, with her friends at Starbucks, all they would do was talk about other people. And she said that she felt that after learning how terrible it is to talk with Shahara and speaking negatively about other people, particularly, I always I tell my students, the girls in the, in, the, in the school, I tell them, you know, if you want to talk about other people, fine. But don't do it when they're not in front of you. Right? At least give them the opportunity to respond and to defend themselves. But to talk about someone who's in the other room and they can't defend themselves, that's not fair. It's just not fair. Right? At least give them the opportunity. You know what? You can tell them, I hate you. Okay, fine. But at least let them defend themselves. At least they, you know, you're a terrible person. I can't believe you would steal my parking spot. Okay. It's fine. It could be that it's legitimate. Right? <laughs> but don't say it to other people when they're not even there to defend themselves. Now, uh, that's not what the Chavetz Chaim would say. Chavetz Chaim would say, even if, don't say a word. Right? Don't say a word. There's many good reasons why not to. Okay? Because most of the time, when we judge other people, we judge with our own bias, with our own prejudice. And it's not always such a good idea. Okay? It's not always, you know, you know there's lots of story that someone, someone uh, went over to the rabbi. It's a true story. He went over you like a true story, don't you? Yeah. So uh, he goes to the rabbi. He says, "Listen, there's there's someone in our congregation who's making believe he's religious, but he's really not. He's making believe." He says, "What are you talking about?" He says, "I'm telling you. I saw him in the middle of the streets in Manhattan. I saw him walk over to one of those hot dog stands that were not kosher. It was clearly not kosher. He bought a, he bought he bought the food, and he just ate it right there." He says, are you sure? He says, maybe he's a diabetic and it's life-threatening and he has to. Right? And the rabbi investigated and indeed that was the case. Mm -hmm. Right? Indeed that was the case. So sometimes we're ready to judge other people. No. The Mishnah tells us very clearly, don't judge. Don't be in the business of judging people. In fact, the first Mishnah of all of Pirkei Avot, it tells us, having mitunim badin. Don't rush to judgment. Don't rush to judgment. You're every, you know who's the judge? I'm not a judge. You can say, listen, I'm not, I'm not right now in the, uh, in the halls of the Senate where there is right now an impeachment trial and I'm not, uh, what's his name, the guy, the, uh, the Supreme Court... Uh, Roberts. Roberts, right? I'm not him. I'm not a judge. I'm not wearing a black robe, right? Guess what? We're all judges. Every single one of us, we're judges. And we judge constantly. You know what the Mishnah says? Don't rush to judgment. Don't be a judge. Everyone has merit. Everyone. I shared this yesterday at the class in, uh, in, in Beth Yishurim, Sunday morning. I shared that I, was, uh, I, I had an experience once where there was someone I really, really disliked and a very, very strong dislike I had for this person. And... I, I'm, I'm talking about really deep. I wouldn't say hate, but almost hate, okay? Like, a, I despise this person. So I, I did what I do many times, is that when I feel that there's something I need to work on, I put up a sign that I'm teaching a new class on that topic. And that way, in the process, hopefully I'll inspire myself and change. So I put up a sign that I was doing, I think it was a three-week or a four-week series on loving every Jew with the clear intention that I wanted to change the way I felt about this individual. And in the process of working and talking about loving every Jew, hopefully I will merit and love this person as well. And I, I, the truth is that it completely changed my perspective, not only about that individual, but about everyone, about all of mankind. And here's the one nugget 
that I took out of that, that, that several week series that I gave. Not everyone's perfect. Not everyone's perfect. Me neither. Do I have to focus on their imperfection? Or can I perhaps focus on something that they are good at? And if we try to look at every person and see what is that one quality, that one virtue that they have in which they are perfect, our perspective of them will change. You know, not every guy is, not every guy is a good salesman. Not every guy is a good manager. Not every guy, every person is good with numbers. Find what they are good at and focus on that. And your perspective of them will change. Right? It, it's a very important fundamental principle, particularly when there's a mitzvah to love every Jew. So when you see somebody or you're interacting with someone or you had a relationship with someone and it goes sour, and now you have a hatred, a disdain for that person, find the virtue, find the quality that they do have and focus on that. And that will change your perspective of them. You know, it's very interesting. I, every once in a while, I have the privilege of meeting young couples and, and, and hopefully assisting them in, in their marriage or in their relationship. Hopefully. I'm not a therapist. I tell them right away, I'm a rabbi. I'm a friend. I can listen. I can try to give you some, but I'm not a professional. But I want you to know, and it's an amazing thing, that even couples who fight, I, I, I don't know any couple here who's ever fought, okay? Ever, right? For sure. <laughs> Never, right? But... <laughs> but you imagine that there are times I've had couples sitting here in this room and they're ready to kill each other. If they had a gun or a knife, they probably would use it. And I'm, I'm the bouncer suddenly. I'm not a rabbi anymore. I'm a bouncer, right? And you wonder... You wonder, didn't these people once say I love you to each other? Didn't these people once say that I do or I will give you my life, I will give everything? What suddenly happened that it changed? Perhaps the, we stopped focusing on the wrong things. Instead of focusing on their qualities, perhaps we start focusing on their flaws. And if we constantly focus on the positive of another person, it's very difficult, very, very difficult to hate them. If you focus on the positive of another person, that's essentially what love is, right? Well, we can talk about love another time. But the idea here is that, particularly with ourselves, the more we are able to stay away and keep ourselves clean from sin, the more our relationship with God will increase. He says, the power of this habituation will distance him from the matters of physicality and make his intellect cleave to spiritual perfection. Okay, so the more we stay away from sin, the more we stay away from things that distract us, the more we, we will... Now, we've discussed this previously. What is the counterbalance for physical pursuits for materialism spirituality right it is impossible for someone to be a hundred grams of holiness and a whole and a hundred grams of physicality materialism right something's gonna have to give right you want to be more spiritual you're gonna have to be less material you want to be more material your spirituality is gonna have to give they don't go together. You can't elevate them both together. And we saw this, I think, in the second chapter of this book, of Ram Chal, of, of Mesilat Yisharim, where he says they don't, it's like oil and water. They don't go together, right? If you elevate yourself spiritually, automatically what will happen is that the materialism is not going to mean anything to you anymore, right? It's like, yeah, it's nice to have a nice car, but it's, it's, it's just a car, right? If my neighbor wants to borrow, I'm not going to say, hey, if I had a Chevy, I'd lend, it to you. I'd lend it to you. But I have a Bentley. I'm not lending it to you. I'm sorry, right? Why? It should be the same thing for you. If it's an opportunity to do an act of kindness, it shouldn't make a difference. 
unless the materialism owns you. And if it owns you, then oh, I gotta be careful, right? Shesov sof yachol lehagia el hanikayon shalin. The process will continue until he will ultimately be able to attain the state of complete cleansing from any improper desire or trace of sin. Shekvar yichbe eish hatava gufanit belibo vihitgaber bo hachemda elahit. He says, in which the body, the fire of bodily desire will have been extinguished from the heart, from his heart through the craving for the divine that has intensified within it. Okay, so let's just, it's, it's, it's difficult concepts, we're going to try to simplify them. The more we're able to change our perspective from being a physically centered human to a spiritually centered, centered human, then it becomes less important. It becomes less important. I, I had this experience. I don't know if I said this story to you. It's very embarrassing. But I'll say it anyway, because it, because it was a turning point in my life. Okay? When I was in Yeshiva, New York, right, we used to, it was a very important thing. And any Yeshiva student that you meet, you can laugh at them about it. For some, it's not funny, okay? It's very serious, okay? And that is, your shirt had to be pressed really really well there was a Chinese cleaner that we had down the block and we would ask them to uh, I'm not gonna use a fell uh, or a slang on this but they, they we would ask them to a to, 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 to press it right you know there's then they it was like it had to be extra starch extra extra heavy starch it was like and it was a thing in the yeshiva it was like okay <clears throat> so when I went to yeshiva in 10th grade in Israel so the, one of the first questions I asked the guys is like, okay, where do you guys, uh, where do you guys do your shirts? Like, where, where do the shirts, like, we, and they looked at me as if I was crazy. Like, generally, they thought I was crazy, like I fell off the moon. And I, and I was like, and they said, what do you mean? We just throw it into the washing machine. I'm like, uh, it was like, it was painful to my ears, like, <laughs> hearing it. It's like, like, what are you, like, what are you talking about? And they're like, and hey, what's the problem? I'm like, well, then it's going to be all creased. I'm like. So you iron it. It's like these guys don't get it. <laughs> they don't get. It. They don't get it, right? But it really bothered me. It bothered me that that was what was important to me. Here I am, a 15-year-old boy, and this is what's important to me. And I'm looking at these kids, and the only thing they were interested in was learning Torah. And I cried about it. It bothered me. Why am I so? Physically, materialistically, and again, it's not a big materialism thing, you know, it's not one of those big things, but it bothered me as a 15-year-old, this is what's important to me. Look what's important to them. And it really turned my life over. I was like, you know something? It really isn't important. It's not important at all. Right? It's like, it was nonsense. It really was nonsense. And from where I came from, this was like, this was the it, this was the thing. And I learned to change that over time. This really isn't so important. Right? So we could be, come from a society or a culture, in the United States particularly, where, I'll give you an example. Just yesterday, there was about a billion dollars spent on a game where two teams were fighting over a ball. Okay? Between tickets, between advertisements, between all of the, you know, extras that go into this, right? A bit more than a billion dollars on a game that's 16 minutes long, okay? Now there are people, David, I'm not looking at you, okay? There are people <laughs> whose sports is really, really important, right? Now let me ask you a question. Now we had a very big party at our house. It was for our, for our synagogue. And one of the things that we did was really beautiful. We had about 50 or 60 people there. And what we did is for the first half of the game, oh, sorry, before the game, we had a mincha service, right? All the kids and their parents. And after that, they came to my house and we learned a little bit. We learned a little bit of Torah. Then we went to, the game, went to my house and we started the first quarter. During the first quarter, we had pizza, okay? Then, after the first quarter, is a halftime show. Well, we had a very different type of halftime show. We all went back to shul, and we all learned. 
Go learn. And the kids sitting and learning is the most beautiful thing. It's like, this is what the real halftime show is. Right? It really is. In Houston, Texas, in a little synagogue, there are people sitting and learning Torah instead of watching the immorality and the indecency of the world. And then they went back, they came back to my house, and they watched the rest of the game with hot dogs and wings, right? Because you have to eat the, the, the you can't eat the, the milk after the meat. So we first had the pizza first half, and then the second half we had the meat, right? And then they were, right? But it was an incredible thing. And I was wondering, why weren't they back on time? They weren't back on time for the third quarter, you know, is the, with the kickoff. I was wondering, what's going on? I prepared all the food, everything is ready, all clean from the first half, we cleaned everything out, and now a second, second half. Hey, where were they? Well, they were all learning. They got so immersed in their learning, the kids, that they didn't want to stop. And they said, okay, now it's time to go. Well, one second, we're just finishing. We're just finishing to learn, right? <laughs> but I've been by people in their homes when there's a game and someone blocks the screen for one millisecond. <laughs> And they're, they're, they're ready to throw their bottle of beer at you and they're ready to yell at you. Yeah, we're in the middle of a game. We're middle. It's like, this is the most important thing on earth. So what is important? To yell and scream at someone? The game? Character? It, we really need to take a moment to think what are our, our priorities. And once we understand what those priorities are, I, I said this quote numerous times, and please forgive me if you're hearing this again, right? But I say this from Rabbi Noach Weinberg, the head of the Eisha Torah, uh, the founder of Eisha Torah, a blessed memory. And he used to say something. He says, if you don't know what you're ready to die for, you haven't begun living. It's a very amazing statement. What am I ready to die for? Am I ready to die for my family? So why did I live for my family? Am I ready to die for my religion? So why did I live for my religion? Am I ready to die for my career? Nah, I don't think anybody is ready to die for their career. But yet people live for their career. If you don't know what you're ready to die for, you haven't begun living. Live for it. Live for your family. There's no one who's ever said on their deathbed, I wish I spent more time at work. No. What do they say? I wish I spent more time with my family. I wish I spent more time with my children. So we need to really identify, and this is what, what Ramchal is taking us through this process of crystallizing what are those values? What are the priorities that we have in our life that we're missing? That aren't on mark? Maybe I'm focusing on the wrong thing. Okay. And by the way, I believe that... The, the destruction of, of television with advertising, with fashion, what that's doing to our culture is irreparable. Irreparable. We're, we're people, uh, we, we need to have this, we need to. It's amazing how we need things, right? It's like, you know, the, the CEO of, of Nordstrom said, there is nothing that we have in our store that people need. Only what people want. Desires, urges, temptations. Right? You know what window shopping is? You know what window shopping is? It's, it's, I think it's a biblical prohibition. Okay, I think it is. Because in the Shema, at the end of the Shema, we say, You should not go run after your eyes and your heart. Your eyes, ayin ro'eh, the Lev Chomed, right? Your eye sees and your heart desires. So when you're going window shopping, what are, you, what are you looking at? You're looking at the clothes you're soon to buy. Right now, I'm not. I'm saving up for it. Right now, I'm just looking. I just enjoy looking at new things, right? And before you know it, that's your next expenditure. So the idea here is that we need to, to crystallize what are those values? What are those morals? What are those things that we're not ready to compromise on? And what are those things that we are? If football is not our priority, then why do we make it a priority? So I missed the touchdown. So I didn't see the interception. 
So, right? I used to love watching baseball. Then I got bored to death. No, no, it's like it is. It takes forever. No, but as a child, I loved baseball. We used to listen to every game, right? Yankees, the Mets. You know, some in my family were Yankee fans. Some were Met fans. Is no it that? Jay fans? No, we, no. We didn't grow up in Toronto. We were in New York. We're a New York family, right? Eventually, I went to Israel, and I was off the grid for a long time. When I came back, I'm like. The Yankees still the team, right? <laughs> I'm living in Houston. I might as well just go for the Astros, right? Right, but it's like, okay, so now I'm gonna. But so, is my life dependent on it? People who that's their whole life. They'll tattoo themselves the the Astros logo, right? They'll tattoo their face. They'll 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 paint their faces. Is that really our values? Is that really our essence of who we are? I'm not, again. I'm not knocking those who do it. But for us to just here in this room to evaluate what are our values, okay? Mm-hmm. And then his perception will remain unclouded, pure and clear, as I wrote above in the beginning of this chapter. So that he will not be enticed. And he will rem- he, and he will remain beyond the reach of the darkness of his physicality. And he will be entirely cleansed from any trace of sin, in whatever he does. So here we are, right? What the Ramchal is telling us is that the more we identify our stumbling blocks, we identify what those things are. Now, I, I want to I want to be, be very clear. It does not mean that now we shouldn't buy fashionable clothes. It doesn't mean that now we should throw out our televisions and we should, that's not what we're saying. At least identify it. At least identify it. Buy fashionable clothing. It's fine. Go to the shows, go on your vacations, but remember, that's not what I'm here for. I actually once asked my rabbi if I was correct in my thinking that vacation done properly could be a huge mitzvah right what's the what's the purpose of our life is to serve the almighty we work hard in fact it says in the torah six days a week work and work and work and work on the seventh day rest it's a day of rest for you to connect with the almighty well, that's what a vacation should be. If a vacation gives you the opportunity to rejuvenate, to reconnect, to realign yourself, it could be a very, very holy and, 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 and admirable vacation. It's not a waste of time. On the contrary, you're re-energizing yourself so that now you can do your work properly. So that now you can, you can, you can, you know, sometimes we get, it gets cloudy, it gets busy. So we lose focus. So what do we do? So take a break and get back into it. So it could be a very holy thing. I don't want you to think that you're going to leave tonight and you're going to say, this rabbi is a crazy extremist, okay? (laughs) He's crazy, okay? Because he said television is bad and he said that all these materialism is bad. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that it has potential to be very harmful and move us away from our priorities. What is really important? And the minute we're able to identify, you know what? It isn't that important. You know what? My phone is not so important. I could be without my phone. In fact, there's now a very big trend among CEOs where they don't use their phone during the day or they go to dumb phones altogether where they just use a flip phone and it's only for phone calls. Because too much of the day is going on to responding to things and sorry, can't reach me, call me. Right? Don't leave, don't send me. Because the emails also, it, it, it becomes a very, you know, I, it's funny. I, please don't take this the wrong way. But most of you know that if you send me a long email, I'll just write you, please call me. Okay? <laughs> right? I'm not going to write back a whole long email. Right? I'm not, I'm not built for that. I'm not going to write a whole thing. 
Let's talk it out. I'm much better over the phone, much better in person. Let's not, let's, I'm not gonna write a, you know, a two-page letter uh, responding to your two-page letter, right? I'm sorry, right? You forgave me already for years already, right? <laughs> right? Just like, call me, right? So, but the idea here is let's identify where the strengths and weaknesses are. Let's identify what is important and what isn't important. Less important. If you could prioritize from your entire day all of the things that you do, what is important, what isn't important? What do you do just for fun? What do you do because you love it, and because, even though it's bad, or you know, or it's not good for you? It, by the way, this is an important exercise with diets as well. All of the things that we talk about spiritually also go very, very, very in sync with a diet, right? If you think of all the things that you eat, is everything you eat perfectly healthy? <laughs> No. So, the first thing to do is at least identify that it's not. No, don't stop eating it necessarily, but at least know this is not good. I'm going to eat it anyway, right? But at least I know it's not good. And okay, but you understand? Don't fool yourself and say, "Eh, it doesn't make it's good. It's fine." That because that's when when craziness sets in, is when you think the bad is good. <laughs> To at least identify what is and what isn't good. Okay. Ice cream isn't a food. Oh, ice cream is very good. Ice cream is very good, especially if it's chocolate ice cream. Yeah. Absolutely. Right. You know, you know my favorite uh, ice cream. Any. Any chocolate ice cream. Chocolate mm -hmm. with chocolate, crunchy. <laughs> on the chocolate and with more, more chocolate. chocolate. Exactly. Yeah. Top top right. top vanilla, you can give to my wife. My, my wife is vanilla. I don't touch vanilla. It's like, it's too vanilla for me. Right? <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> okay. So now, on the top of page one sixty-five, we see Ramchal explains that it was the perfection of this trait that King David spoke of in Psalms. This trait is the trait that King David worked on that helped him uh, in his greatness. Behold, it was regarding his perfection in this trait that David, King David rejoiced in his attainment and said, Erchatz b'nikayon kapai v'asovavat mizbachacha Hashem. I wash my hands in purity, which is the, the trait that we're talking about now, purity and cleanliness, and circle around your altar, Hashem. Ki be'emet rak mi she'inake legamri mekol nidnud chet v'avon, for in truth, only one who is completely cleansed from any trace of transgression and iniquity, hu ha'ra'ui lir'ot et p'nei ha'melech Hashem, is the one only the person who cleanses himself is the one who is suited to see the presence of the King Hashem stand in his presence. Right? That you stand in God's presence. Only someone who's clean. You can't come to God with stains. Right? It's a very interesting thing that the halacha says that a, a Torah scholar who has a stain, I hope I'm a Torah scholar, but if I am, <laughs> right? But uh, a, who has a stain on his garment, should be put to death. Now, it doesn't. Don't jump out of your seat, okay? <laughs> okay? Mitchayev bin Afsho, it, it, it says. Mitchayev bin Afsho is he's, he is, uh, his, his soul is responsible. It's a very, very strong term. You know why? When you're, a, when you're a dignitary and you represent a government, you better represent the government properly. Right, if you're a minister of, uh, of 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 a government, and you go and you're all with a stained shirt, right? What is it? What are you representing? You're representing a government, right? Not only yourself. If you only look at it as yourself, well, me, I'm a shlomazel. So what? What should I do? So I, I spilled my spaghetti on my shirt, but that's not you now. Now you're representing people. You're representing a whole country. You better represent your country properly. What happens when you represent Torah? You're representing the Almighty. 
You better believe you better have clean clothes. No stains on your clothes. Because you're representing the Almighty. If you don't represent the Almighty properly, chop, chop, right? You got to be careful, right? It's a very serious thing. And this is the very reason why when you asked those boys about shirts, you were thinking, if I don't have my shirt ironed and pressed and starched, I'm going to die. No, that I wish. <laughs> I wish that was the purity of my thoughts. Right? I wish. But you learned that the Torah study was important than the shirt one. That's and correct. And nobody looked at Ben Gurion twice when he showed up in a short sleeve shirt with no tie on. Right, right. It was, they actually made made a law in the Knesset. You have to come in a suit and tie now, so that so that there's a little bit more formality. formality. So it's, it's I, I, I don't think sliding from reality. Right. right. I, I I don't think you can come in flip flops anymore to the Knesset, but I, I I'm not sure. But either way, um, it's a very important thing. It's well, a very Kippur, important thing. What's that? On Yom Kippur, you're supposed to have new clothes, right? Well. Every Jewish holiday you're supposed to have. In fact, men, I hope I don't get you in trouble. But for every festival, a husband is supposed to buy his wife new jewelry. Do you know that? New clothes. No, no ideas. No, I shouldn't give you any ideas, huh? <laughs> She's like, you owe me for Pesach last year. You owe me. <laughs> and the Jews have a lot of holidays, okay? Rabbi, there's a solution for this when you take the credit card and you go charge it, and then you dispute the charges later. No. Oh, yeah. <laughs> No, no, no. That's a joke. That's a joke. <laughs> I know, I know. Got a question, Matt. Yes. So if we are saying have to only, do it only if somebody that's completely cleansed from any trace of transgression and iniquity is the one who is suited to see the presence of, of the chef. Right. Nobody can go there. One second. Everybody's everybody has an imperfection and everybody's has a little sin in there. R right. But what but we're what we're trying to do is get to a place where we clean ourselves. Just by the way, just to, to, to contrast this to other religions, right? We don't have intermediaries. We don't go into, into a confessional and uh, slip them a 50 and say, hey, forgive me for my sins, right? We, we don't do such things. In, in Judaism, you are held accountable for yourself. No one died for your sins. No one will die for your sins. You are accountable for your own sins. You are individually responsible and you have a direct relationship with no intermediary not even a nice Jewish boy, to intercede on your behalf. Okay? It's you directly with God. And it's a very special, that's why when we pray, we say, Baruch Atah. We say, blessed are you, Hashem, our God. We talk directly to God. Not through a third person. It's very direct. When we want to communicate with God, what we, our goal is, is to remove any trace of that sin, any sin that we have. Are we perfect? No, God knows we're not perfect. Neither was Moses perfect. Right? There's no righteous person on planet earth ever who did good and didn't sin. There's no one. So we all are in the same game of life trying to perfect that today should be better than yesterday and tomorrow will hopefully better, be better than today. That's the, and God doesn't expect from us perfection. Mishnah says, Lo alecha Your job is not to be perfect. But you're not allowed to stop striving for perfection. Our goal is to strive for, for perfection. Will we get there? Hopefully. But we won't be held accountable if we don't reach that perfection. Our goal is to go, we want to be perfect. We want to attain perfection to be clean of all sins, of all traces of sins. And today they have traces of, of peanuts are prohibited. In schools, no peanuts. Most schools today are peanut-free zones. But now there's some extreme classrooms or, or, or schools that there's not even traces of peanuts. It means if it was in a facility that had peanuts, it's like, right? Imagine that for our sins. Like not even a trace of anger. Not even, not even a trace. Now forget not getting angry. Not even a trace of it. Now imagine what that would mean. It means no more, no more passive aggressive. No, no, it's it's okay, it's okay, right? <laughs> not, not even that, right? I'm, I'm keeping my mouth shut. I'm not going to say anything. Right? No, no, right? 
Okay, who are we? This one, this person who removes all, cleanses himself of all trace of transgression, is the one who is suited to see the presence of the King Hashem and stand in his presence. For without this cleansing, one must be only ashamed and embarrassed before the Almighty. And like the statement, the idea contained from the statement of Ezra Sofer, where he says in the book of Ezra, when he, when uh, confessing the sins of Israel, Elohai boshti v'nichlamti laharim Elohai panai elecha. My God, I am embarrassed and ashamed to lift my face to you, my God. Meaning I recognize my imperfections. I recognize that I, that I haven't cleansed myself yet. I recognize that I've got a long way to go. I'm embarrassed to even raise my, my eyes before you, may raise my face before you. Although essential, Nikiyut, this trait, our sages tell us, is not easily acquired. It's not easy for someone, you know, it's, it, every company needs to do this every once in a while. And they need to have a, an audit, right? So an audit of the books, of the bookkeeping, is one thing, it's numbers, numbers are numbers. Right? You can fudge numbers a little bit, but you can't fudge everything, right? We need to have an accounting of our soul. We need to have an audit of our soul, of our character. And that audit, like most audits, even if they're just numbers, they're not pleasant. Have someone mixing into every single dollar that you spent and every single thing, right? Imagine if we took an audit of our own thoughts, of our own actions, of our own intentions. Yes. Isn't that what we're supposed to do on Rosh Hashanah? Rosh Hashanah every year? Yes, so absolutely. Every, every Rosh Hashanah Yom Kippur, which is why we call it the days of awe. It's the days because we realize, you know something? It's uh, when the rubber hits the road. They're like, this is, this is it. We're, we're being held accountable. The high holidays are called days of accountability. Because we're, taking, we're owning up to our actions and hopefully cleaning ourselves with them. And that's why on Yom Kippur we wear a white garment. We try to wear white, white clothes. You know why? We're trying to show that we're at least trying to be pristine. We're trying to be clean of sin. We're trying to mimic the angels. The angels don't sin. Right? They have no temptation. We're trying to be angel-like. We don't eat on Yom Kippur. We don't do things just like angels. We're trying to keep ourselves perfect. And say, you know what, God... Really, I'm trying to be angelic. I'm trying to be something special, right? But what can we do? You have placed the evil inclination in us, right? And sadly, we've fallen astray. But we have that opportunity every day, every week, every month, and every year to cleanse ourselves. Right? We start off a day. You know how we start off a day? We start off with Mode'ani. Right? Thank you, Hashem, for giving me back my soul. You gave me back my soul. Or say, just tell us that God takes your soul at night, right? And God cleans it off, brushes it, polishes it, gives it back. Because sometimes you can go to sleep at night. You can be anxious. You can be worried. You can be concerned. You can be afraid. You wake up in the morning you're like, what happened last night? I, I, don't, I don't remember. Right? And you wake up with this freshness, with this, you know where that comes from? That's God saying, here, I'm going to clean it off. It's my precious soul. Now I'm giving it back to you. And what do we say? Rabbi Muratach, exactly. God believes in us. He says, I'm going to give, you're going to have another day today. And this day you're going to be amazing. And I believe in you. You know what else we say? The soul, God. The soul that you bestow, bestowed that you, within me is pure. Torah. Atabrata. You created. Atayitzata. You've crafted it. Atanefachtavi. You blew it into my, into my nostrils. Right? The living soul that I have. You did it. And and you are going to take it from me at the end of my life. You're going to take back that soul. Imagine we say this every single day. Why do we say it every day? 
This is true. Because we need to be reminded every single day. Remember how precious life is. Remember how precious every opportunity is. Remember how precious every breath that you take. The Mishnah says, I'll call Nishima or Nishima for the Talmud, right? For every breath that you take. Tahalelia. Praise the Almighty. Every breath that you take. You know, it says that the, the birds thank God every day. And the dogs thank God. And the cats thank God. And all the animals. There's a book called the Perakashira, which is the, the, the chapters of the chapter of song. And it goes through all the animals and all of the praises that the animals sing to Hashem. It says that the waves, you know why the waves go back and forth in the ocean? You know why the waves go back and forth? Why can't they just sit still? Because the Talmud says that every wave is saying thank you to Hashem. Again, and again, and again, and again. Thank you. Thank you. That's the, the water is giving thanks to Hashem. We need to do the same. I'll call Nishimo Nishima for every single breath that we have to thank the Almighty. Okay, now that we've established that we have this, this we, we have this creator and we have this incredible ability to build that relationship, God is our investor. He puts us on a mission. He says, go. Go do good things. I believe in you. You can do it. Uh, we fall short of our obligations. Ah, another day. God says, I believe in you. I'm giving you another day. You could do it today. Today's the day. And by the way, don't think that the mission that the Almighty gave us is like, oh, God really wants me to be a, a sage living in Jerusalem with, uh, you know, getting rid of my house and getting rid of my car and getting rid of... No. God wants you in your life to bring Him in. For five minutes, for ten minutes, for twenty minutes. Start with a few minutes of consciousness. That's what prayer really is. Prayer is getting into a into a focus, getting into a into a frame of mind of recognizing that the Almighty is right here. He's right here, right in front of me. We can talk to him at any any place. You don't have to be in a synagogue to pray. Be anywhere and talk to him directly. God, come on, really. Now, I, I don't know if I told you this story, but it really is amazing. It's an amazing story. My daughter, she started driving uh, when she turned, uh, what is it, 14 and 8 months or 15? 15 and 8. 15. 15. When did she turn 15? So it really is amazing. She's a very nice, she's a very good driver. Thank God. Hopefully she'll drive safely her whole life. She will never have any, any, any issues. So she told me an incredible story. And we, she, we go to school together in the morning because I teach her class in the mornings. And uh, so she always asks to drive. You say, if we're ready early enough, she can drive, no problem. So when she drives, it's very, very interesting. There's one intersection that we go through that could be a very challenging intersection for a seasoned driver, even more so for a novice. Right? Even someone, right, someone who is experienced, it can be a very challenging, it's a very busy intersection, and there's cars coming from all directions, cars turning, cars here, cars there, and there's no light there. Right? So whenever she drives, that intersection is clear. It's an amazing thing. You know what she told me? She said on Yom Kippur, one of the things I asked Hashem was that he shouldn't get me stuck in an intersection. <laughs> right? And you think. A 15-year-old girl, right? God is busy with enough things. He doesn't have to care about your intersections. <laughs> oh, yes, he does. Yeah. Even your small little worries, even your small little concerns, God cares about that too. You know? When she gets to that intersection, it's, always, it's amazing. It's always clear. And we think like, there's better things to do than worry about my little worries, my little concerns. Really? What? What is, it? what is it? Tell me the great things that God has to take care of that isn't important enough that He take care of your little things. You are His world. The Talmud in Sanhedrin says that a person should always be in the habit of saying the world was created for me. The world was created for me. Yeah, 
you, you think you're selfish? Yeah, God says you are. In the relationship that you have with God. In the relationship you have with God. It's not like, oh, it's, it's for other people. It's for the, there are other people. No, it's for you. God wants the relationship with you. With every single one of us. God wants us to talk to Him. God wants us to ask Him. So that every time we get to that intersection and it's clear, you can say, thank you, Hashem. I love you too. Thank you. Conversation. What would we do for our children to give us a call every day and say, hey, Dad, I just wanted to say thank you. I wanted to say I love you. Right? What would we do? Right? You think Hashem doesn't want to have that relationship with us? Of course He does. So let's talk to Hashem and let's bring Him into our lives. But you know what blocks that relationship? This is what Ramchal is telling us here. Materialism. Materialism is the, it, it, it's the, it's the one thing that contradicts that relationship. Till we put it into its place. When we recognize that the materialism is there just as a tool to serve us, but not for us to serve it, then we're in good hands. But if we're here to serve it, it's a dangerous place. It's a very dangerous place. So my dear friends, drive safely. Don't get stuck in intersections. <laughs> not in the intersections of the roads and not in the intersections of life. Hashem should always protect us and save us to, uh, from, from any type of challenge. And we should always have clarity to be able to drive through those challenges. Amen. Amen. Have a good night. Amen. Amen.